um, I think we could go ahead and, and, and begin the presentation, okay? Okay. I already hit record, so you can go, go with it. Okay. Well, hi, everybody, and, and thank you for uh, attending our, um, our Eagle First Flight webinar uh, hosted by George Garcia. Uh, my name is Edward Pleto. I'm part of the CAT soft support team here. In, uh, we're located in South Florida, um, in sunny South Florida, even though it's raining today. But um, in this webinar, it's basically going to give you an introduction to how to start up with Eagle. Once you download it and install it, it's going to describe the different areas of Eagle and how to go about it. Um, but before we go into that, before we enter, we want to um, inform you of, of some additions that we have uh, added to Eagle to expand its capabilities immensely. And um, so I'm going to just show you some slides uh, of how to uh, access or get some information about it and let you know what they are. So, and my name is Ed. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me at ed at catsoftusa.com. Okay. So, um, oops, the wrong screen. Okay, here we go. So um, what we've done is that Eagle um, Catsoft Computer has been cre uh, working on Eagle for the past uh, 26 years, more or less, and we're really good at doing Eagle. Um, making it a stable, available uh, to all of our users. And, but we, we understand that in the industry we needed to expand certain capabilities of it. Uh, to be able for us to do that would actually take uh, away maybe from the development of Eagle itself. So what we decided was to partner up with some third-party tools. That way we could expand the capabilities and they would be as compatible as possible with Eagle. So that's a, a rough description of what I'm going to be describing to you. So what we've done is that we have uh, partnered up with Autodesk on a, on a program that they have called Fusion 360 and uh, also with another tool, tool that we have called IDF to 3D is what we could do is that we could export our Eagle board file uh, in IDF format, we have a conversion tool which allows you to export the step file, which is going to be compatible with virtually any mechanical application in the industry. <clears throat> there will also exist a link in our conversion tool that would take you directly to Fusion 360, which is an online-based mechanical uh, collaborative tool application uh, created by Autodesk approximately a year ago. It's actually very powerful. Uh, it's fully online, works very well, created by Autodesk. Okay? The other tools that we've included is uh, Spice Simulation, Signal Integrity, <clears throat> and a Library Builder. Uh, the ways of being able to create uh, components using a third-party tool without any type of really, um, doesn't really have much of a graphical interface. It lets you just take the specifications from, a, um, uh, from the spec sheet from the manufacturer and build the part. So, let me just give you some uh, screenshots of more or less what it looks like. <clears throat> First of all, I want to talk a little bit about our Eagle to Fusion 360 interface. What we've done is that it takes only three stages. First of all, once you're done with Eagle, you're going to click on the button that's on the top toolbar um, that says IDF to 3D. When you click on that button, it's going to take you to the Simplified Solutions uh, website, which you're going to go ahead and log on. And that's going to just match your components that you've populated on your circuit board with a step, a step component representation. So they're going to be in full 3D. Now, once you've uh, matched all of your components with a respective 3D representation, you'll be able to export Eagle to Fusion 360. <clears throat> now, when you go from Eagle IDF to Simplified Solutions, uh, 3D conversion tool, on average, we've noticed around 60 to 66 percent of the components are automatically recognized. So it's only going to be a small portion of the components that you're going to have to actually match with the 3D uh, step file components. Okay? Now, you, um, besides going to Fusion 360, you could actually export them in step file. Now, if you wish to export them in step file, there is a subscription model which is for one user license, it's only $300 if you actually were interested in this, okay? Now, the other tool that we've included is, uh, that we've partnered up with is a, uh, a library builder. So we have an Eagle Library Builder um, being powered by PCB libraries. They've been around for a long time, and they offer a very 
easy to use interface by which you could use the specifications by the manufacturer to be able to export your Eagle file, uh, to, to export your component in Eagle, in Eagle format, that way you could import it, okay? So you tell it what distances, how many pads you have, the sizes, the characteristics of your components, and it will actually export it for you, okay? So it just makes the process of creating uh, Eagle components, especially if it's a complex component, really easy, okay? And we actually have that available. I'll show you what we have those uh, prices available on our website in a minute. <clears throat> now, the third and final one of the other tools that we've included is simulation and signal integrity. We've got, we partner up with a company in Germany called uh, Felicitas. They create a product line called PCB Sim, and, um, and it actually integrates fully within Eagle. In other words, um, you'll see menus and menu options from within Eagle to be able to export, um, to be able to make, to do your analysis when it comes to simulations, spice simulation, as well as signal integrity. We're going to be hosting webinars for each one of these tools really soon, and I would like to teach you how to uh, get that information in regards of the different webinars that we're going to be hosting for each one of these tools. If you're um, able to visit catsoftusa.com, this is our main page. Um, click here on PCB Design Software, and you go to our partner products. You're going to see where we have our uh, information about our, part, our different partner products. And um, we've included some, uh, some short video tutorials in our, each one of them, so you can get a, an essence of what they mean. If you wish to go ahead and register for the different webinars that we're having for each one of our third parties, go ahead and click where it says training. Click here where it says webinars. Our webinar information is being hosted on the Element 14 um, a calendar. So once you click on uh, training and click on webinars, you scroll down a little bit here where it says webinar schedule, right here. And here you'll be able to see the dates and times of the different webinars that we're going to be hosting. So you could go ahead and do um, select any of these and register. Well, in my behalf, my name is Ed. Uh, you can always email me at ed at catsoftusa.com if you have any questions in regards. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass you on with George Garcia. George Garcia is our resident engineer expert located here in the office of South Florida as well. And he's going to be taking, taking you live with Eagle and uh, giving you the basics to get you up and running in the most optimal way possible. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, George. Okay, I'm going to take this back from you, Ed. I, uh, I was passing it to you as well. So. Now, I'm going to share my screen and let me know if you can see it. If anybody can see it, please send it through the chat. Okay? Yeah, we could see it, George. Okay, cool. So, like Ed was mentioning, my name is George Garcia. I handle support for the U.S. Um, and in this first flight, what we're going to be working with is creating our first schematic, okay? Strictly, that's the only thing we're going to be working on today It's the schematic editor. We're going to make a very simple board. Um, it's going to be a very simple uh, development board for a processor, and in this case, we're going to use a microchip pick. However, you could use whatever processor of your choice. Usually, when you start off with a new chip, this may be one of the first things you do anyway. So here we're looking at the Eagle control panel. I've expanded my projects tree. And I'm in the I have the Eagle folder and I have the examples folders. Both of these exist by default um, when you first install Eagle. We generally recommend that users save their work to the Eagle folder. On a Windows system, it'll be located inside uh, the documents library. And the good thing about it is that every installation of Eagle expects that folder to be there. So when you update Eagle, install a new major version or anything like that, you don't have to worry about moving your files around because every version of Eagle expects that folder to exist. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start a new project. Uh, right click here on Eagle, select new project, call it first flight. You're going to see it's an empty project that's stated here. I'm going to right-click on it. I'm going to say New Schematic. 
And here we have the schematic editor. Now, a couple of things to note, if you have Eagle installed on your machine, your icons over here are going to be different. Um, in my case, I have the PCB SIM interface installed, and it overwrites the default icon settings here. Okay, So yours will look a little bit different. You'll have Design Link, and you'll have uh, LT Spice. But either way, none of that we're going to be dealing with today, but just in case you guys notice a difference. Okay, so this is the default schematic editor. We're going to go into the add command. This is a command we use to bring in components. Okay, so we're going to click on add. Here are all of Eagle's default libraries. Initially, it can be a little overwhelming because there's so much. Um, but I'm basically going to show you initially how you can search for parts. Okay, something that that maybe you won't expect is that Eagle is very strict about matching whatever you type into the search box. So basically, if you're off by a letter or a number relative to what's in Eagle's libraries, you're not going to get anything. And as an example, I always like to search for LM555, okay, triple five timer. Very common. Anyone who gets started in electronics, this is usually one of the first chips they'll run into. Okay, so I'm going to hit enter to search for it, and Eagle's going to tell me, sorry, no match. Okay, now, if you're not aware of how strict Eagle is with the matching, then this would be very scary. Because, you know, very common part, how am I going to find anything if I can't find this? So the key to making this work is to make liberal use of wildcard characters. And everything is explained here. Um, Ego actually does a good job of telling you how you can expand the search and improve it. Few people ever read it. So just to start, let's say I put in a question mark here. Basically what that means is if the name of the part starts with LM555, I don't care what that last letter is bring it up. I want to see if that's maybe the part I'm looking for. So this generalizes the search a bit. I hit enter. And now we have some results. Okay, so I get the LM555D and the LM555N. Okay. So now we can see why it didn't pop up before we hadn't put the D or the N to specify. Okay, we can actually generalize it further. Let's remove the LM and put an asterisk here. Basically, what this means is anything can fit here, multiple characters. So if we were to translate this into words, is the part name can start with anything. doesn't matter how many letters. It could be a million letters. It can start with a million letters, random letters, doesn't matter, characters, whatever. It includes 555, and then at the end it has some other character. Okay? <coughs> so let's do this search. Okay, now we get a few more things. And yeah, now we can get the NE, the SE, the UA. Okay, we'll also get some other things that don't make any sense for our purposes. Okay, because these aren't 555 timers, neither is this. Okay. But you get the idea of how this works. A very key point to keep in mind with when you're searching for parts in Eagle, okay? Generalize your search as much as possible. It's going to save you a lot of time. So I'm going to go ahead and start fresh because I want to set this. Just click X, it'll take you back to the initial libraries. From this point forward, I pretty much know where everything is, okay? And I'll tell you some of the key libraries you want to keep in mind um, when you're designing your own parts. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a frame just to establish my work area. So I go to the S, which is the frames library. I expand it. These are basically title blocks, okay? And there's lots of different standard sizes. Um, I'm going to just use a, a letter landscape orientation. I could use a letter portrait as well. But just for giggles, we'll use letter landscape. So I hit OK. Letter landscape, you'll see that it's floating on the mouse cursor. And usually, you want to place these at the zero, zero point on your schematic. I'm going to left click to place it, and you'll notice that I can continue to place more if I wanted to. In Eagle, one of the first things you need to figure out is the fact that you always select the action you want to perform, then the item you want to perform it on. This is kind of backwards compared to what you're used to doing in Windows. However, in PCB design, you'll often be performing the same operation many times. So you'll be moving a lot of things at the same time. You'll be adding parts. So this workflow 
is usually better suited for fast design. A little it takes a little getting used to, but once you are used to it, you'll see that you can work very quickly. So I'm going to hit Escape. Brings me back here. I can now go and select another part. I'm going to hit Cancel just for a second so we can zoom out. Now what I'm doing here is, if general, with Eagle, you're, we recommend that you have a mouse with a scroll wheel. Scrolling forward zooms in. Scrolling back zooms out. If you click the scroll wheel and hold it, you'll pan. Okay. If you click the scroll wheel and hold it, you're panning. There's also uh, the zoom commands up here. Zoom to fit just makes everything fit in one go. If there's any questions at any point in time, please feel free to send them through the chat window. I'll answer them as I, as I, as I see fit and I can get to them. In any case, anything I don't answer during the presentation, at the end you'll have an opportunity to, to ask the questions. Okay. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in a library. Okay, and this is something you'll probably end up doing often, so I do want to cover it here in the schematic. The libraries that show up in the add command are the libraries that are in use. Okay, so basically these libraries are active and available for being searched. Very important point to remember. Not all libraries necessarily have to be active. So in my case, there's one library that I want to put into use because I'm going to use a part from it. So I'm going to go several ways we could do this. I'm going to go to the control panel. And I'm going to go to another project that has a library I want to use, which is this one. And here's the library. And you notice that this dot here is gray. If we left click on it, it'll turn green. That makes it active. Okay? So inactive, active. Inactive, active. Active, active, okay? So now, if I go to the add command, I can find that library because it is active. It's searchable. Another way you could do that if you can't get to the library through the control panel, sometimes it won't be possible, is to go options, I'm sorry, uh, library, use. Okay, and then we can go to whatever directory, double click on the library, and that will do the same thing. And if I go to add, I can find my library. Now, normally it's all sorted alphabetically. However, sometimes anything with a cap can show up at the top. So if you don't find it alphabetically, take a quick look at the top because sometimes it will it'll show up there. I'm going to go over here to my POV library. There it is. And so the part I want to bring in, which is this. This is PIC microcontroller. This is a 16-bit microcontroller that I've used a lot here at work. So I just want to use that for our example today. Okay, so we have this. Now, what type of circuit, or how do we make sure that this chip has everything it needs to be able to work, at least at a very basic level? You know, we're not going to get fancy, we're not going to put in crystal oscillators or anything like that, but we at least need to be able to, to make sure that it's going to run and do things. So, it's very important that early on you get used to looking at data sheets. So here's the data sheet for this component. And here are the recommended minimum connections. Here's everything you need to know just to get the chip at a basic running configuration. There's no crystals, nothing crazy going on over here. Okay? You can see very basic, a couple of resistors, a few caps. Nothing nothing too difficult to get started here, are the recommended values. So let's go ahead and implement that. Let's implement those functions. So we go over here, and going to the add command, we're now going to go to probably the single most important library you want to be familiar with, and that is the RCL library. Okay. If you remember nothing else of this presentation, please remember the RCL library. Oh, well, there's going to be one more thing you need to remember, but right now, the RCL library it contains resistors, capacitors, and inductors. There's going to be European symbols. EU and US symbols. Depending on where you are, you'll use the appropriate one. I'm in the US, so I'm going to use those. I'm going to use RUS. And here we're going to see lots and lots of resistors, lots of different variations. We have the surface mount components. Now, everything has surface mount is pretty easy. Uh, the, the designations are very standardized. Um, so you can see here the 1206, 0805. 
you'll find there's VIX-03. All the standard surface mount resistors and capacitors are here. Through-hole comp uh, components are a little bit more difficult because there isn't a standard designation for them. So the approach we've taken is in the naming scheme, the first two digits represent the thickness of the resistor in millimeters. The next two digits represent the length of the resistor in millimeters. And the number after the slash represents the separation between the pads. Okay, if you have a V, it means a vertical mount. If you don't have a V, then it's the normal uh, mounting on the board. Okay, so very straightforward. Um, as long as you have a rough idea of the dimensions of your resistor, this will work just fine. Okay, for our purposes, we're going to use the surface mount ones. I'm going to use uh, 0805. I have done 0603 by hand, um, but I tend to prefer, if I can, just a 60805. So I'm going to double click that. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and place this right here. Here, okay, cut that. Another one. R5, so I'm going to have that. There. This is what we're going to be using. I'm going to go to the CUS library. Same thing here. Okay. Basically, you have the uh, the separation being the first two digits here. Anything before the first uh, hyphen, and then you have the dimensions length times uh, width after that in millimeters. Well, in tenths of a millimeter. Okay, and you and the the, the notes, the description will usually clarify it. Okay, when you see grid, that's the separation between the both pads. Over here, and we have a five millimeter separation. Pretty straightforward. So again, I'm going to use surface mount. If anyone's afraid of surface mount, don't be. It's really not that difficult, and especially if you have to assemble on your own, it can be a little bit easier to use surface mount parts. I'm going to put that one here, and I'm going to put this one here. Perfect. Now, very important point. This is the second one you want to keep in mind, okay, if you remember nothing else. On the schematic editor, you'll notice the default grid is set to 0.1 inches. That default is very important. You don't want to deviate from a 0.1 inch. If you like the metric system, just you can change the units. It'll be 2.54 millimeters, but don't change the actual grid size. Okay, and the reason for this is that all of the components in Eagle's libraries are made to that 0.1 inch grid. So if you make components to some other grid or you change your grid in your design, you're going to find that it's very difficult to get things to connect um, because the grid points in Eagle define Okay, got a quick question here. It's a good one to answer. So rotations are handled very simply. You can do it while the move command is active. So like right now I'm moving. If I right click, I'll rotate in 90 degree segments. Um, I can mirror by clicking my scroll wheel. In case of resistor, it's not that important, but for op amps, it comes really handy. Okay, so rotate by right-clicking. You can mirror by doing the, the, the control wheel, the, the scroll wheel click. Okay, so let me show you why the 0.1-inch grid is important. I'm going to turn on layer 93 pins. Normally, you won't have it on. If you're, get, if you're new to Eagle, it may help you avoid some issues if you have that layer on. I'm going to apply and say, okay, and you guys will now see that there's a bunch of little circles. Okay, the centers of these little circles represent the connection points. Every net must start and end on the center of a green circle. If you're past the center by even a hair, or if you're short, fall short of the center by a hair, you won't have a connection. That's what makes it so vital that you stick to a 0.1 inch grid, or it's equivalent to 0.54 millimeters. Okay, very important. Don't change the default grid on the schematic. Once you have a bit more experience, you may run into a situation where maybe half that or a quarter may be useful for you know, orienting some text or something. 
but for now it's a lot easier just to tell you don't change it. Okay, that way you can avoid yourself some, some growing pains. So how do we make the connections? Let's start making some connections here. Okay, the command we use to make connections is called net. It's this one right here. Okay, do not use wire. I know wire is very tempting. It should really be called line. Um, but then again, we have 25 years of history of calling it wire. So hopefully that will change soon. But for now, just know that wire should only be used for artistic purposes. In your mind, think of it as a line command in a drawing program. It's only for artistic purposes. To define electrical connectivity, we use the net command. So we click on net. We can just start making connections. And it's very simple because we are on grid. If we were off grid, this would be very, very difficult. By right-clicking, I can change the wire bend style. In general, on a schematic, you'll want to just stick to 90s. But again, everybody has a different style, so it's not a hard, fast rule. Here we are. I'm going to now proceed to turn off layer 93. It's not necessary to have it on. But sometimes, especially when you're getting started, it can be handy. So those are our basic components here. Obviously, we have nothing that has power to it. So let's go ahead and define our power rails. And the way we do this is using supply symbols. Okay, That's the easiest way to do it. We could obviously draw explicit net wires all over the place to connect the power and all that stuff. Um, but that makes the schematic very messy. So it's a lot better to use supply symbols. And these can be found in Supply 1 and Supply 2. These are the two supply symbol libraries that ship with Eagle. Now you'll notice that there are symbols for all the rails, most of the standard uh, values. However, if you needed you know, some, some weird value, let's say, I don't know, like 100 volts or something like that, then you would have to create that supply symbol yourself. These cannot be renamed. So if you rename them, they won't change what they're connected to. So for our purposes, we're going to use a 3.3 volt supply symbol. I'm going to put that over here. And you notice that if I have a pre-existing net and now I try to connect something else to it, Eagle wants to know if you want to rename the net. In general, you're going to say yes. We have that. here, and let me bring in ground symbols as well. Very important to have your ground. Go to make our connections. You notice that Eagle automatically puts in the junction. Okay, you never want to be placing junctions manually. If you if you find yourself having to do that, you're doing something wrong. Perfect. We received a question. Let's check out what that question is. Two or more supply symbols on the same schematics would result in ERC error, right? Do we ignore those? No, you can have multiple voltage rails on the same schematic sheet. The ERC error will come if, for example, on the same net, you have two different supply symbols, then you'll have an issue, and that you wouldn't ignore. Uh, when would you say no to renaming the net? It's a good question. Um, basically, if you actually, if you went to there by error, if you connected there by mistake, then you can maybe say no. Um, but there's very few pa practical occasions, if you know how to use Eagle, where you'll have to say no. So I would even go as far as saying always click yes. I would go as far as saying that. Um, if you're if you're connecting one net to another, almost always you'll want to, the the renaming to occur, because if they if they don't, you're going to generate an ERC error because you have two differently named nets that are touching. It ends up becoming a short. So in general, say yes. Um, I would be really hard pressed right now to come up with a good reason to say no. Go ahead and just move this a little bit closer because I think it looks tidier. Okay, so 
the only other thing I want to add here is a switch, okay? Because right now, um, this reset circuit is never going to reset. Uh, but there may be an occasion where we want to reset the the processor. So I'm going to go ahead and do the add command. There are several switch libraries. Yeah, I'll start with switch. As you can see here, switch, switch Alps. Organized by manufacturer, I'm going to go with switch Amon. And I'm going to bring in the 10XX switch. I actually have a few of these in the office, so come in handy. Go ahead and place this one right here. And using the net command. Once again, it wants us to connect. I'm going to say OK. Just to get the latest name. If you, for whatever reason, wanted to preserve the old name, you would just have it. You would select the other name, and then they would both be in dollar sign two. Go ahead and put this here. Copy. Copy the ground symbol. Merge net. Yes, and there we are. Okay, so this represents all of our um, all of our reset circuitry. Here we have the power rails that we needed to have. Now, the only other thing we're really missing is obviously power, and we're also missing some connectors to be able to access to break out these pins. So for power, I'm going to do the simplest thing possible, which is basically to use a linear regulator. I'm going to go to the VREG library. I'm going to use one of, uh, I could use it in a TO92 package. These are the 78 series of voltage regulators. We can find the data sheet over here. They are many variations on that part for different um, power rails. So we have a 5 volt, we have an 8 volt, we have a 10 volt, we have a 12 volt, and we have a 3.3 volt um, package. So I'm uh, sorry, part. So in my case, I'm just going to use the 3.3 volt one. Or I'm going to assume it to be because if we look at the Eagle part, there isn't there. They have double X's to allow you, since they use the same packages, to fill that in. You know, it's basically it's a generic part. So in my case, I'm going to use this one. It's a standing that. As far as the capacitors, let's go ahead and put these in over here. Copy that one over here. Now the output is going to be 3.3 volts, so automatically make sure that that's going to connect. Have our ground connection, and I'm just going to put the output to be this. A key point with supply symbols is that all the instances are automatically t connected together. The shortcut to, to change the wire rotation is just to right click. I mentioned that earlier. While you're routing, just right click and you'll change the bend style. And the net command. Again, I'm letting it connect. And let's go ahead and put in a couple of connectors here. So we could use all sorts of funky, wacky connectors. Um, I'm going to go with the simplest, which is the 0.1-inch header. All of the connectors in Eagle are in the CON libraries. You'll see them over here, C-O-N. They're all organized by manufacturer. You have Harding, Samtech, Alps, Molex, everything and anything um, is here. But for our purposes, I find it easier just to use the, 
the pinheaders are in the pinhead library. So we go over here to pinhead. And they're all organized by the number of pins they have. And so I'm going to use one of these over here for the input power. Whatever the input power might be. So I'm going to use eight pin headers for the outputs of part. So I'm going to do this over here. I should really put like one more over here somewhere. I'll have to make some room. You can perform actions on a group of components. So this is going to get a little messy. Okay. So right now I've selected these, but I would also like to include all of this stuff over here, right? So if I have the control, um, if I have the group command active and I hold control. I can toggle the membership of all these parts to that group. So I can add them in one by one. So now all of this is part of the group. So as you can see, you're not limited to just using a rectangle. Okay, You can actually, using the control and left-click method, you can add to the group. Furthermore, you actually aren't limited to using a rectangle. If you just start clicking points, you're going to end up forming a selection polygon. You can make any sort of funky shape you want to only have those components as part of the group. If you double click, it'll automatically close it. Okay, and there we go. We did the same thing. Then go move. Kind of stretch this out a little bit. Way I have some more room for this connector. Okay, pretty straightforward. And then the only other connector we want to add is a six-pin header for the programming connector. So I'll put that over here. We can go ahead and make connections to these without any issue. Let's use the net command. And we can, if we go to the data sheet, we can actually find out what the maximum voltage this thing can take coming into it. So let's go ahead and check that out. Input voltage, 25 volts max. So we need to put in between 5.3 to 25 volts max. Go back to our schematic. It's important whenever you can to document things. Um, because six months down the road, you may not remember why you chose a certain part, and that might be important. So the more you document, the better off you'll be. Now right there, what I did was to select the group and, and move it. I selected the group with a square, and then I selected the action I wanted to perform. If I were to just left-click, it would only move the component that I left-clicked on. But if I hold Control and right-click, I move the whole group. If that's hard to remember, if you just right-click while the command that you want to perform is active, you'll see at the bottom, Move Group. Same idea. For me, Control right-click works very well, so I generally will stick to that. Go ahead and start making some of the connections to the connectors. So I'm going to go right here. That one. See, it's very important. Just try to make things as readable as possible. That's the magic to schematics. 
making everything as readable as you can make it. Okay. Straighter the lines, the less crossing over there is, the better off you you'll be. And notice that I don't worry about being on grid or making sure everything is connected because I'm on grid. I don't have to focus on that. Always make sure you're on grid. So here we've broken out all of those pins. Now we're going to go ahead and break out these pins as well. Try to do the same thing. possible to make a bigger window. That this one. Well, Perfect. See, so far, very easily readable. Now I could really spend a lot of time cleaning this up as well. You know, moving things around and making sure it looks nicer. Again, control right click to move the group over. So, the only last set of connections I need to make here are for the programming header. So pin one now one goes to the clear signal. So you can see I've crossed over a few nets here, but as long as there's a dot they're not connected. Okay, only where there's a dot is a connection properly defined. Now, two goes to 3v3. And three goes to ground. Or goes to pin four. Five goes to pin five. Six is left unconnected. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and make these connections here. That's basically it as far as the wiring up goes. Now, I don't like the appearance of this 3v3. It's getting kind of run over. So I would like to move that text around. And often you'll find that you want to move the text around as well. Easiest way to do this is using the smash command, which is this command over here. Click on smash. Click on the component, and you'll notice that all the text associated with that component will become selectable. And I clicked on the wrong component here. I clicked on the jumper instead of the symbol here. Perfect. Now I use the move command. I make sure. Now when this happens, where you have multiple items near each other, and Eagle isn't sure which one you have, as you notice, the crosser is going to change. 
And if you right click, you can cycle through the various nearby items. Once you're on the item you want to, you go to actually select and change, then you left click, and now you can move it around. not interrupting with any other text. Okay? So that's a smash command, which you can use to, to kind of clean up the orientation of, of the text. So here's our basic design. We haven't filled in any values for any of these, so let's go ahead and do that now. And we do this using the value command. Okay. Just 100 ohms. And you can type in the word ohm if you want to. Um, I believe there is a way to get the omega sign in. I've never been able to do it successfully. So I usually either just leave it at the prefix or I can put in ohm if I need to. The 0 0.1 microfarad. And again, all of these values are coming from that data sheet I showed you guys. Here, I'm just using data sheet values. So from here, this one is 0 0.33 micro, 0 0.1 micro. So that's basically it as far as our schematic goes. Um, that's all we have to do. I want to take a moment and just show you guys some of the additional functionality you can take advantage of when working with your schematic. Uh, first thing I'm going to do now is save it. So I go File, Save. First slide already. I'll call it First Slide. Code 1, underscore, and 2. So we've saved our schematic. Now let's say, for example, we want to obtain a bill of materials from this. Several ways you can do it. There's a million uh, tools to make bill of materials for Eagle. I'm going to show you the basic one that comes with it. So up here you have two icons. One is execute script. The other one is run UOP. Scripts are Eagle commands, just as they would be typed on the command line, but in a list. And Eagle basically just processes them one at a time. In the case of, UOP, of UOPs, these are more complex actual programs. And we get a lot done through them. We can export DXF through them. We can generate bill of materials. We can generate a 3D output. We get a lot of work done through UOP. So it, it pays to be aware of this possibility. So you go on one UOP. I go, in your case, it's going to go to to the location in Eagle. In my case, I had been somewhere else last time I ran a UOP. But you'll be here. Okay, and there's, uh, last time I, I counted like 108, 110 of these. Each one does a different thing. And by going through the control panel, you can explore what each one does. So the, for the purposes of this uh, demo, let's just run BOM EOP. You'll see it creates a bill of materials. We can organize it by different parts or by values. You'll see it organized with pin description. Um, they can carry manufacturer's part number and different SKUs and all that good stuff. Okay, we can save it as a CSV file, as a character separated uh, value list. Uh, text, we can save it as HTML. We can do whatever we want with that. So I'm going to go ahead and close this and show you guys how. Oh, we had a question. Possible. Can we add this information? Yes, you can. I'm about to show you how. Um, I don't know if the window is bigger right now. Hopefully it is. Okay. To add the attributes, okay, you can do so by going to the attribute command. And I'm going to show you the one part that has it. We click over here, and we see all of these attributes. These are defined in the library. You can change, you can adjust, you can create new ones. Creating new ones is very simple. Okay, if we go over here, for example, I'm going to create one. See that the attributes are empty. I say new. I'm going to say MP or MPN. 
And for this one, it's pick 24F16KA1 02. And I say OK, and there it is. Okay, so now if I run that UOP again, you guys will now see that for that component, I have the manufacturer's part number. Okay, so the key lies in just creating your attributes so that they all have the same names, and then you can assign for each part different values. And this allows you to fill in all of this information on your own. Okay, um, let me see what else I wanted to cover. I think that's basically it. Any questions, guys? Please feel free to, to, to type any questions. This basically concludes our, our demonstration for today. Like Ed mentioned, next month, on tu the second Tuesday, we're going to have Episode 2. And we're basically going to continue with this design and do the PCB for it. Okay? So for today, we're just doing the schematic. It's our first flight, so we want to take it step by step. Today, we're just going to do the schematic. And then next month, on the second Tuesday, we'll do the board. And every month, we'll have, uh, we'll have a, a, new, a new first flight, covering something, something simple, just one thing. And we're going to go through that. OK, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to start answering questions. OK. Sometimes I have TTL and CMOS on the same schematic with predefined power pins. What is the best way to connect VSS and ground? Basically, whatever the part that you have, uh, it can have its own power pins. As you see here on my uh, schematic, this part has VDD, VSS, and it has two, two sets of it. Okay. The name of the pin, if it's set up as a power pin, will be overwritten by whatever supply symbol you connect to it. Okay, so you don't have to worry. If they have to have different supply rails or different voltage levels, you just give them different supply pins and you'll be okay. Um, I hope that that answers the question. Okay, if it doesn't, please send something else to chat. Um, any other questions? Stop sharing my screen. Okay. Got several questions here in the Q&A section. Let's figure out. Okay. In the case of uh, Jeb, that you're asking for other documentation for the PCB layout, if you go to our website under Tutorials, you're going to find some tutorials by Jeremy Bloom. He does it in several steps as well. He has one video dedicated just to the to the PCB layout. So go ahead and, and check that out. Let's go ahead and answer some of these Q&A questions. The search only search part names. It doesn't just search uh, part names. It can also search um, through the attributes and through the description field. So it doesn't just strictly uh, go to the part name. Uh, why not just add all libraries? All of the libraries that ship with Eagle are added by default. However, users sometimes store libraries in other directories, and there's no way for Eagle to be aware of their existence. So that's why you can't just add everything at once. Additionally, some users like to only have certain libraries active, especially if they've built up a large library of parts. Usually they'll just use that one library. So they'll disable everything else and just use that one library. Are the footprints IPC spec? The footprints are made according to the manufacturer specifications. They don't necessarily always follow IPC. There is an SMD IPC library, which as far as I know is pretty comprehensively follows the IPC specification. If it's a requirement that IPC specifications be followed, then you could use something like the PCB library expert that it showed at the beginning of the webinar. Um, that tool is set up by default to make everything conform to IPC. So, you know, if that's a strict design requirement, you can go ahead and, and, and consider that tool. Uh, found it very hard to align some components and wires. 
They can be depending on how you set up your grid. If you're on the PCB and let's say everything is SMD or everything is through hole, things become very easy. In the case of SMD components, usually a, a half millimeter grid is enough to place everything and keep everything aligned. If you're using through hole, then usually you want something like a, a 0.05 grid, and that'll allow you to pretty much keep everything aligned. Things get tricky when you have to um, when you have a mix of both, where you have some through hole and some SMD. In those cases, you may find yourself having to switch between different uh, grid settings, which actually reminds me of a very cool feature that I kind of want to show you guys. So let me go ahead and take care of that. Bear with me one moment. I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. A lot of commands have the opportunity to, to do an alias or the last use. So for example, if I right-click on the UOP icon, you'll notice that it shows me the last UOPs I've run. Okay, so I can very quickly run a previously used UOP. I can do something similar with the layers. I can go to a previous configuration. I can create new configurations. And I can do the same thing with the grid. So right now, I'm on 0.1 inch grid. So I can just say English. And then let's say I want everything in metric. I can right click go new, say metric. Now very quickly I can switch between the two of them. Okay, you can do something similar on a board with uh in which you have a mix of of uh through hole and surface mount parts. Okay, so these are some of the commands that support aliasing. You can tell if a command supports aliasing by looking to see if the icon has a little uh arrow pointing down on it. If it has that, then you, it supports aliasing. The commands that do are the scripts, the uh, UOPs, the grid, and the layers. That's everything off the top of my head that I can remember that supports aliasing. Okay, so it's a very good feature to keep in mind. Um, okay, I answered that one. Is it possible to move the pins on the part in the schematic? No, it is not possible to move the pins on the part in the schematic. Any adjustments of the symbol or the package, those have to be done on the uh, in the library, which again, we'll do a first slide on, on making a part in the library and how those work at some point. Good references that we recommend. Um, there's several books available on Eagle. One of them that I could recommend is uh, Make Your Own PCBs with Eagle by Simon Monk. That's a good book, especially if you're just getting started. Um, that's that's a good one for getting started. One that's a little bit more advanced but covers a lot of ground is Matthew Scarpino's Designing PCBs with Eagle. That one's relatively new. It covers creation of UOPs. So those would be the two that I would recommend as far as references outside of CADsoft. The manual is, is your biggest reference. Everything and anything covered within Eagle is in the manual. So feel free to always look that up. It's accessible uh, in the control panel from the documentation tree. Uh, find out about other UOP options. Um, the UOP options, the best way to research them is to go to the control panel. You go into user language programs. And basically, if you click on a UOP, you'll get its description. Let me actually show it. Let me do that. Okay, so if we go to the control panel, okay, you just go to the user language programs tree, and if you click on a UOP, it'll give you some information about it over here, and you can figure out what it does usually. So I'll check use layers, uh, component array, arrays, um, silk screen, um, something like, for example, find is a UOP that has a lot of options to it. You'll get the full documentation on it, how it can be run from the command line, all of its options, uh, searching orders. So all of the information on a UOP is basically found through the control panel. We're looking at some point through the UOP dialog itself to be able to have this information that way you don't have to go to the control panel, but that's the best way to research it. 
another way to research it or another place you can find um, UOPs is on our website. If you go to our website under Downloads, User Language Programs, you'll find other UOPs and you can search for them. So very handy uh, tools. Definitely check them out. Um, as was mentioned before, this is being recorded. It will be available shortly after um, this webinar finishes. As soon as I basically get the links, I will post them up. And then finally, I have how do you create a custom part symbol. We'll be covering that on another first flight. However, recently we've been doing a few creating component webinars. So if you just go to LMF14 and look up the most recent webinars on Eagle, you'll be able to, to check out those. Okay. So guys, I want to thank you very much for your attendance. If there's any future questions or anything you guys need, please feel free to contact us at support at cadsoftusa.com. Okay, my name is George Garcia, and I hope everyone has a great day. Take care.